Of course, we're going to begin here, though. Begin uh, this morning with a live look at the United Center in Chicago. Today is day four of the Democratic National Convention, and it's a biggie. It's a big day for Vice President Kamala Harris. She will officially accept her party's presidential nomination tonight. In her speech, she's expected to tell her story of coming from a middle-class neighborhood and her work as a prosecutor before rising to the highest level of American politics. Last night's speeches included uh, were actually were, were quite passionate. Uh, there were passionate stump speeches from Democratic leaders such as former President Bill Clinton, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, each making the case for Vice President Harris. Oprah Winfrey also delivered remarks championing independent and undecided voters and urging them to focus on values at the ballot box come November. But the main event came when Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz accepted the vice presidential nomination, delivering an emotional and motivational speech that leaned into his experience as a football coach. It's the honor of my life to accept your nomination for vice president of the United States. We've got something better to offer the American people. It starts with our candidate, Kamala Harris. You know, you might not know it, but I haven't given a lot of big speeches like this. <laughs> but I have given a lot of pep talks. <laughs> so let me, let me finish with this, team. It's the fourth quarter. We're down a field goal, but we're on offense and we've got the ball. We're driving down the field. And boy, do we have the right team. Kamala Harris is tough. Kamala Harris is experienced, and Kamala Harris is ready. Well, CBS Morning's co-host Tony DeCopel is leading our coverage of the DNC in Chicago. Um, so, Tony, I think uh, sort of what I thought was interesting about Waltz's speech is I think we saw a little bit of an edge on him that we didn't see before. Still kind of your Midwestern dad kind of uh, energy, but a little edgier and maybe a glimpse of what we're going to see as the campaign continues. What sort of stood out to you about what, whoever you heard from last night? Yeah, well, you know, with Tim Walls, I think what you'll hear from political experts is that he managed to take the small town values that he grew up with and redefine them with a little bit of a democratic gloss on them. So rather than have those values as they are in country songs and all the like associated with Republican politics, he said, look, it's about loving your neighbor and it's about minding your own business. He said, keep the government out of your bedroom. He also tried to add a little detail to the gaps there are in the Kamala Harris policy platform. She's only been the candidate for, what, 30 days? She's not got detailed proposals on everything. And he said, look, all you have to do for your undecided friends is clip what I'm about to say. And then he went through some bullet points, lower taxes, lower housing costs, taking on big pharma, and, and fighting for freedoms across the board. Bill Clinton, also a fantastic speech. He talked about warming up his voice with me, 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 as you might do to prepare for an address. But he said that's what Donald Trump is in, in every speech. It's all about me, not about you. He said next time, don't count the number of lies in his speech. Count the number of eyes in his speech, meaning the self-references. And then Oprah, my goodness, what a surprise that was. It was like a shotgun of, of, of applause when she came out onto stage. It was kept under wraps. And she reached through the camera and tried to talk to independents and undecided voters and get them to... Turn out, she said, I vote because that's what Americans do, Anne Marie. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, shocker to see Oprah because normally she sort of stays out of the political fray. Um, and so we'll see if we'll see any more of her as the campaign rolls on. Tony, thank you very much. Thanks, Emory. So for more from the DNC and the Trump campaign, let's bring in our political panel, Joel Payne and Leslie Sanchez. Joel is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. He's also the chief communications officer for Move On. Leslie is a CBS News political analyst and a Republican strategist. All right, guys. Uh, Leslie, we're going to start with you. Uh, I want to begin with some, I guess, some fact-checking when it comes to Tim Waltz and his speech last night. Uh, let's first begin with uh, what he said about the Affordable Care Act. He said of Trump and Vance that they'll repeal the Affordable Care Act, 
Well, the CBS News uh, confirmed team labeled this misleading, saying that in this election cycle, Trump has actually continued to criticize the law, but has said that he doesn't support terminating all of its policies outright. In March, he said that he was not running to terminate the ACA, but instead to make it better and cheaper. Leslie, what do we know about uh, the Trump campaign's plans when it comes to health care? I think particularly Republicans have talked about this for a long time. They felt that they wanted to protect private insurance. They felt that in the negotiations for ACA that they could have, it could have been done uh, without raising taxes, protecting private, you know, your ability to go to your own doctor, which many people lost, and also for lower cost and not increasing those premiums. Those are some of the tenets that Republicans would go back to. They felt that it fundamentally was flawed in the way it was put together, but there wasn't a discount of the fact there needed to be done, to, uh, more to be done in Congress and by any administration in getting health care costs down, but protecting the right of, and the ability for people to go to their, their private insurer. Okay, there was a, another uh, quote from Waltz. He said last night, quote, take Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, their Project 2025 will make things much, much harder for people who are trying to live their lives. I think the, the fact that he sort of called it their Project 2025, a CBS News confirmed team has also labeled this somewhat misleading, saying that Trump and Vance have not actually adopted uh, this blueprint at all as their campaign platform and that they have attempted to distance themselves from it. So this question is for you, Joel. I, I actually have, I feel like we haven't heard a ton about Project 2025 at the DNC. This was something that actually social media really put a spotlight on and then the Democratic and then the campaign kind of woke up and started to take a little bit of advantage of it. Uh, is Project 2025 still a concern for voters? Okay, so Emory, you know I would never get on the wrong side of CBS News Confirmed. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, they, are, they are top notch and folks should trust them. And um, I understand the, the goal of what we're trying to do here. Uh, the spirit of what Tim Walls was saying here was correct in both this scenario and also what you were just talking about related to the health care law. I mean, Republicans and Donald Trump led uh, Republican efforts to repeal the ACA when he was president. If not for John McCain, they would have repealed it. And Donald Trump has been very clear that he, over the course of his political career, would love to gut the ACA. And so, you know, folks may interpret the language on that differently, but I think the intentions are clear. I think same thing here with Project 2025. Uh, I've lost count of how many people who used to work in the Trump mm -hmm. administration who now uh, work for have supported Project 2025, which by the way, when they shut down a few weeks ago, all that means is that a lot of those folks who are working on Project 2025 are gonna be a part of the Trump uh, transition project, which both campaigns have the opportunity to set up a transition operation. So again, uh, the smart folks at CBS News confirmed, I'm not, not getting on the wrong side of them, but I, I do think that the spirit of what Tim Walls is saying here is correct. And I think the American people, they don't have to just trust what Tim Walls said last night. They can, they can trust their own eyes. They can go read Project 2025. They can go look at the connections. They can go look at the vote back when hey, Donald Emory. Trump was president. He would have with the ACA. Go, go for it, Joel, Leslie. Joel, I just have to say, <laughs> I've never seen so many Democrats, and Joel knows I'm such a fan of, of Joel Payne. I've never seen so many Democrats promoting the Heritage Foundation in all of my years in politics um, and, and, <laughs> and their policies. And it's so hypocritical in the sense to say that because conservative writers who came from an administration of 5,500 people, that a handful of people or 100 people went over there and wrote policy papers, that the same, it's duplicitous because the same argument could be made on the left. How many people from the administration, from the Obama administration, going, to, you know, from the Biden-Harris administration, write the Green New Deal, write the most leftist progressive policies and are promoting them? The distinct difference is, uh, Donald Trump has come forward and said he disavows that Project 2025. He does not want any part of it. He didn't have, uh, partake in writing it. Um, and we don't hold him at his word, but we want to hold uh, Harris at her word when she says she's changed her mind on policy positions she ran on as a candidate in 2019 or her, or her positions in the U.S. Senate. I just think we have to be consistent. If we're going to say they changed their mind and maybe they have a new position on it, then we take them at their current word. But to force the fact that to say that the Trump campaign supports 2025, say that three times fast, mm -hmm. when they have articulated they do not, um, I think it's a false argument on behalf of the Democrats. And, and Marie, we're not going to let Project 2025 get Leslie and I 
in crosshairs with each other. No. That, that's my girl. Not going to happen. No, there's, just there's, disagree with no, it's all love. It's all love. So listen, before I let you go, though, I do want to talk to you, uh, Joel. Uh, as you know, tonight is Kamala Harris's big night. We're going to be uh, hearing from her. She's going to accept the nomination. Uh, we've heard a little bit about, you know, what the speech might be about, that she's going to uh, talk about her journey. Um, and I thought to myself, we've actually heard a lot about that since she's, um, you know, been moved to the top of the ticket. I want to ask you about something else that we haven't heard about at the, in the D, at the DNC, which is the segment of uh, Democratic voters who are concerned about what's happening uh, about the war in Gaza. Um, you know, from what we're hearing about the DNC, there are there have been protests, they have been peaceful, but by and large, almost in we haven't heard about it in hardly any of the speeches at all. And I know there was a group that was hoping that maybe a Palestinian would be a Palestinian American would be able to speak on on stage. What's your take on how the campaign is handling this particularly challenging issue? You know, it is a challenge. And look, this is the work of coalition building, right? It's making sure that folks feel heard and uh, and feel engaged. And we've seen Kamala Harris on the stump um, in a couple of occasions when there were protesters who've interrupted her speeches, very respectfully engage with those protesters, ask them to allow her space to continue her comments, but invite them uh, to be a part of her broad coalition. And I think more of that is happening at the DNC, I know there are some who want a more prominent role on the speaking stage for folks who have stronger opinions about what's going on in Gaza. And I know those conversations are ongoing. But I think one thing we do know is that Kamala Harris has turned the page on maybe an era in this conversation that was more alienating mm. to those folks. I think there is a greater opportunity for comedy and for bringing together some of the disparate opinions on that. Um, the work is hard. I don't think anybody should sugarcoat it. But one thing about Kamala Harris is she's committed to do the hard work and she's committed to have the hard conversations. And um, I, I, I do think that the temperature is very different on that conversation within the Democratic coalition from now until what it was a few months ago. Last thing I'll say, Kamala Harris still has to introduce herself to so many Americans mm. who are just learning about her. This convention has been great. She's got to stick the landing tonight. And a lot of Democrats have a lot of confidence she'll be able to do that. Uh, that's a good reminder. You know, when you're in news, and I'm sure when you're in politics, you listen to every speech all the time, and uh, you forget <laughs> that there's a lot of Americans that have other things to do, and so this will all be brand new to them. Uh, Joel yeah. and Leslie, thank you so much.